What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is highly skilled in modern furniture, retail, and textiles. He's the recipient of an honorary doctorate from the New York School of Interior Design. He's passionate about the hospitality space and design in general. He has a detailed eye for highly designed products. He's the executive chairman of Krypton Fabrics. He's the former CEO of Design Within Reach. He's the president and CEO of Heller Furniture. He's a magnificent storyteller and a fellow nutmegger, John Edelman. Welcome, John. How you doing? I'm I love good, the man. intro. <laughs> it's, well, I love the intro too, and I'm really honored that you're here to spend time with me because the amount of companies that you've taken from A to B and the stories that you have to tell around them, especially as it relates to design, is really it's just stellar. So I'm just honored to like share your knowledge with all of our listeners. Um, but before we get into that, because obviously this is defining hospitality, what does hospitality mean to you or how do you define it? I mean, I always think of hospitality as such a broad term, but in general, it's how you wish to be treated when you go to someone's home or how you would like to treat people upon entering your home. And I've had a chance to practice that definition in a few different businesses, right? We had 15 showrooms at Element Leather. We had 40 stores at Design Within Reach. And, and what's the first impression you'd like to have? Uh, and just quickly, you know, at Design Within Reach, I had a, a whole system where as you walked in, we handed you a water. We didn't shake your hand. We, we, we put a water in your hand. So the first thing we did was welcome you with a small gift. And um, that was my way of practicing hospitality on the outset. And that's in the actual stores, right? And then I'm also yeah. curious as far as when you find a business that looks really interesting to you and you love the story and you can tell the story and amplify the story, when you're building that team, how do you take the idea, that idea of hospitality, of giving them a water, and how do you apply that to the team that you surround yourself with? Because obviously you're great at finding these companies, but you're all, you can't build all these companies and grow them by yourself. You need a great team. How do you like, how do you give your team that big hug so that you can get ready for takeoff? I mean, sometimes it's literally a big hug. You know, I'm six foot four and people call me a, a hugger, you know, I'm one of those guys. <laughs> um, but, you know, in people's resumes, honestly, if you go back, I love to find out if they were a bartender, a waiter, a waitress, or some part of that industry, because they understand people, they understand how to treat people. And, you know, everybody, I always teach people, like when they come into a store or to a showroom, you're their bartender. And you can't imagine what they tell people on the floor of a regular retail store. They're so much more open with them than oftentimes their friends. And I practice the, the concept of whoever asks the most questions wins. And I always tell everybody, you want to know how many children they have. If they have children, they entertain, not entertain. How, many, how often do they go out? How, often, how much time do they spend in their home? Because nobody, if you're, if you're practicing the concept of hospitality, you're never selling anything. You're defining a need and then servicing. I love that. Because it, if you're never selling anything, you're really focused on that relationship or the space between you and the person you're talking to. And it's really listening and, and looking for the, the needs that they have. Because it might be your product or it might be something else. I always say, I just what lights me up more than anything is shortening other people's journeys whether I'm involved in that or not, as long as I've left a positive impression and, and shortened their journeys, I feel like I've done the right thing. How does that resonate with you? Oh, totally. Nobody wants to waste their time. So I, my experience with that, my best example is I was in the flat iron design within reach door and the client came in and I had been teaching the staff and coaching them how to be docents and telling the romantic backstory of the furniture and this client came in and the, one of my salespeople walked up and greeted them at the door, gave them the water, and then gave them the best presentation I've ever seen in my life of the Eames Lounge in Ottoman. Told the story of Charles and Ray Eames winning the design contest from the MoMA when they were at Cranbrook and how Modern was born and they were with Florence Knoll at the same time and how Modern was being born at the Royal Danish Academy at the same time with Clint as the, as the uh, dean and and uh, Wegner and all the other great designers in school and how the bent plywood and it's supposed to fit you like a glove. And 
Like I'm crying by the end of the presentation. And the client says, thank you so much, but I'm looking for a bed. <laughs> you know, so, so that's like he screwed up. It was a terrible way to, to do it. He, he was telling the client what they wanted mm. versus finding what they wanted. And in, to use your terms, lengthening that journey. That wasn't mm. cool. So, yeah. so well, that's the opposite yourself. of what I like doing. He lengthened it. Yeah. I like to short it. Um, that's what I'm saying. It was, oh, yeah. it was a mistake. Yeah. So as you're spouting off all those great designers and the story of design, um, I've sat there and listened to you go on and on transfixed on, you know, when you, you, you're, you're so good at tapping into that vision of what the original designer's vision is. And now you're taking that vision and, and getting it out to the masses. How do you see, like, since you were at the helm of design within reach and now Heller, like, how do you see the role of design and furniture in shaping that overall idea of hospitality? to make uh, how you make others feel, but also like to filling those environments where they go. Yes, yeah, so I'm also uh, 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 on the board of directors of Be Original Americas, where we fight for authenticity. And that story is the kind of reinforcement of authenticity, telling the story of the pieces. And let's say you check into a, to a hotel or go to a restaurant and the furniture's fake. How about the food? I mean, what's gonna happen then? Wh where does it stop when you imitate? So I think telling those stories and knowing the stories of the product reinforces the brand stories as well. Um, you, you can't have like a fake chair in the lobby and say you're giving real truffles or something. You know, it's like the whole thing bleeds into each other. I think the story is everything. And the better the design is, the better it integrates those stories into the, into the design, into the overall fabric. Like, so if you have a couple of Danish pieces, how do they relate? Were they designed at the same time? Or do you mix and match? And it's a juxtaposition of stories, but the romance is always there. Hmm. I, I love how you put that because I've often found some of my best, ho specifically hotel experiences, are where everyone from the bellman to the housekeeper all the way up to the general manager are well versed in being able to tell those stories. So that as you're walking through to your room or you're coming out of your room or they're taking your luggage, and you're, they, you, they find you looking at a piece of art or a piece of furniture, they can jump in and tell the story. How do you educate, not necessarily the customers are, that are making the buying decision for your product, but how do you get them to educate all of their stakeholders that are interacting with their guests to be able to tell the story? That's like storytelling at scale, if you will. I did it once. We were, the, I think it was with a, a loft hotels. We did a, 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 a co-branding deal with Design Within Reach. We had the catalogs in the room of the product that was in the hotel and people understood those backstories. I haven't gone beyond that. Um, I've been to a hundred hotels where I love the design and I've asked the front desk who the design firm was and they didn't know. That's a crime. And it's a crime because there's a reason they hired the design firm. There's a reason I asked. It's because it was, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. or, or I want, you know, and I want to get the backstory. They didn't know. I think it's you know, oftentimes it's, it's a lost art um, and it's a shame, but I, I don't want to like disparage anybody because there's high turnover and things like that. But knowing that backstory of design, I think gives value to the, to the end product, mm. to, to the, to the, to the uh, establishment itself. I completely agree. And it makes it a lot stickier. Oh, I don't know, more impactful and a stickier experience for the guest as well. Um, Good question. So, I, I teed you up there also as like a masterful storyteller and you really are. And one of the things that like I was transfixed on in a story you told me, we were, I think we were having coffee or something down in, at the train station in Westport or something, but it was uh, just how you would go around and identify companies like a Design Within Reach or a Heller or others, identify these companies and, and like see the vision that they might be missing and then figuring out how to get them more market penetration and scale them. So really, you know, via acquisition and then getting your yeah. vision implemented, like walk us, can you just walk us through your, your process on how you do it? Because for all the entrepreneurs listening, I think that we could all benefit from hearing about that. So just to be clear up front, 50% is luck and being in the right place at the right time. Um, so with that said, like there's no, I'm not a genius. I've been very lucky you know, tons of times. Um, I think 
having a brand that is ahead of the business is key. So Design Within Reach had this amazing brand. You know, the right people knew about it. People that love modern furniture knew about it. It was urban. Um, they didn't know that it was, you know, almost on the verge of bankruptcy that it started doing knockoffs and had been making all these mistakes. And then left the core mission, right, which was to be the world leader in authentic modern design. They stopped saying that. So John McPhee was my business partner of 30 years, who's now the CEO of Chilowich. Uh, we were together on board there, and we realized that we just had to tell the truth and just explain to people what our mission was, be consistent about that mission, and then and, and talk about it, and then expand upon it. Because you can't just resell products. I think people get bored with that. Our job was then to find the next modern and bring people in. So I also say, if you can speak in superlatives and tell the truth, you've won. Edelman leather, literally the world's greatest quality leather. It just, it was. And when you start with that line, then you explain it. Design within reach. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the world's largest collection of authentic modern furniture. True. You know, and Heller's superlatives are, are evolving, but we're, you know, we're the largest collection of, of authentic modern design uh, for indoor, outdoor, made in America. Mm. And, uh, and we're expanding upon that. So you have to choose something, be very honest about it, and then expand upon it. If you see a company that's not taking advantage of where its position is, that's an opportunity. And then when you say to be very honest about it, that's really just staying in tune with the values that you've either acquired or reestablished within a company. Yes. So in the leather business, my father and mother founded the company, Edelman Leather. And all his romantic stories were rooted in truth. My father was one of the greatest stories of all time, but he invented the stories. And we tell these 30 minute elaborate stories about ships sinking off the Russian coast and being pressed underwater for 200 years and the, and the, and the bottom of the ship's wood ingraining the leather with that, not only the scent, but the pattern of the wood. And we spent years researching and re replicating that pattern, even the smell. Now, there were some origins of that story that were true, but in general, my father made the stories up. And if you asked about it, he'd always say, Library of Congress. I got it from the Library of Congress. So that was storytelling. But then if you can tell stories that are actually authentic, you just win. It's just the, it's the way to go. Mm. And that's what I, I really discovered at Design Within Reach and in collecting of modern furniture is the stories are cool and, and they're real. And people who care about design want to learn the stories. They're learners. Right, they're professional learners, and if you can teach people something, they've had a better day, and so have you. My grandfather from Russia, my my father actually every day he'd say, "What'd you learn today?" If you learned something, it was a good day. So we go about that. We teach um, and and tell those romantic stories. I think that's that's the best way to go about it. I think it's also really important because so many of the hotel designers that oftentimes the front desk doesn't even know who did it. The amount of time that they spend, like rule number one is develop the narrative of how you connect that design to the location of where it is. And if you can find product or have a story for a product, that well-designed product that can dovetail in nicely with their narrative, it just, it only makes that kind of sticky and impacted um, guest experience all the more impactful. Um, yeah. As you think about, so there, there was the design within reach, but then I know you're, you said 50% of it is luck. But when you think about where you are with Heller and how you found Heller, like, how were you lucky there? How did, how did, you, how did you set the table for luck? We bought design within reach in 2010. We started work January 4th of 2010. The New York Times uh, did an interview with me. And it was my greatest honor to be interviewed by the New York Times. Like, to me, that was... And still is. I mean, just the biggest deal. And I waited for the article to come out. And I'm like, it's going to be heroic. You know, Edelman and McPhee come in to change the, the world of design and save design within reach. And the title of the article was, Is There a Solution Within Reach? And the photograph on the first page was not of me. It was of Alan Heller holding a chair over his head, suing design within reach for knocking him off. And he had sued not only design within reach, he had sued the buyers uh, personally. He was hated in the company, and he was 100% right. Because Iron Reach did the worst thing you can do. They copied his chair for, for short-term profits. Mm. And on top of that, they called it the Alonzo, just to rub it into Alan Heller, you know, making fun of his name. <laughs> 
And so we went up there. We bought the company January 4th. We were in his office in February. And I said, Alan, you know, you're right. I, I apologize I'm, for my predecessors. We'll, we'll get rid of all the knockoffs immediately, not through the stores, through the outlets with no advertising. And uh, let's build a business together. And that's where the friendship was born. And he really just appreciated that. Mm. Ten years later, uh, we built a beautiful business with him. We were by far his largest client. And uh, after I left the business, I was like, Alan, I'd love to buy your company. And he, and he tortured me. Like, he tortured me. You have to deal with my widow. I'm going to get buried with all the uh, molds. You know, uh, and then he then he come close to me by the company and he just back off at the last second. And unfortunately, I didn't realize he was he was ill. Mm -hmm. And it was true. I ended up buying the company from his widow. But I put myself in the right moment with him because I was desperate to run Heller. I don't know what it was. It was a fantasy of all the businesses out there, of all the different opportunities. I wanted to own Heller. And it's that, that my other experiences haven't been like that. You know, before I lived in leather, I spent eight years with my brother in the shoe business, you know, making shoes, living in Brazil, living in China. And I acquiesced to my father and mother and came home. Design within reach, the acquisition, honestly, I had a friend that knew a friend that had was the largest investor. And John McPhee and I met with him when within three months we were owners and, and running it. It, it. it was just happened very quickly. Heller was my passion. That was the difference. I, I worked and worked and worked to get this business. I had no idea that, uh, that that was the photo from the New York Times article that you were so proud of. And actually, as you think about it yeah. from a story, that's like a playwright couldn't think about that. I know. I, it's turning a negative into a positive. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's also just being it's being authentic, right? You just the first meeting you had was to go straight to like enter the danger zone, if you will, to meet with him and talk with him and, and set everything straight and just be your authentic self in front of him. But Dan, you've, you've defined that. You're in an industry that rewards that. And you know, we have a very small industry. Um, a mailing list for you, if it's excellent, with 30,000 names, Yeah, um, 35,000. And you know they see through you in two seconds. If you start telling stories, if you're inauthentic, if you don't work hard, you're out. It's, it's not forgiving, like, and it shouldn't be. Uh, so, so I think it, it lends itself to this industry and, and, you know, we have an industry that demands quality and if you ship them bad quality, you're out, they see it. Yeah. If they want a custom color, well, you better make the custom color exactly right in a combination of natural light with fluorescent, whatever they tell you to do, that's your job to do it. So there's really no room for a lack of authenticity. Well, then if we were to bridge the gap between, I know we're talking about design within reach and Heller and now the hospitality industry, where do, how do you see heller approaching the hospitality industry like if i were if you were to look three years out ten years out what like what do you see what's your vision as it pertains to hospitality i see it's a go-to brand for indoor outdoor modern furniture right like and yeah, i know what hospitality needs they need it in stock or very quick delivery you know check uh, they need a sustainability story that's true check uh, they need fantastic design i should have said that first you know check it's not we're not reinventing the wheel, although they do demand fresh product. So we don't reinvent the wheel, but we will invent like the lounge chair or the look of it, and we'll have new product coming out. But I see it's like as a go-to friend of the hospitality industry. It's not, you know, it's not the most, it's not easy to do, but, but it's not curing disease or, 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 or really doing things that'll go down in the history books besides the, the world of design. So it's very doable. Alan built this brand and he never called anybody back. He never went on a sales call for the most part. He went to trade shows and never scanned anybody or followed up. So like, I love that because now like people who actually wanted to be a part of the brand can be a part of the brand. So I call that, he's like the field of dreams guy. If you build it, they will come. Yeah, but they barely came. <laughs> like he had three customers. <laughs> but he was happy. He didn't need to make money. He could care less about money. Yeah. Um, but that also starved the company. He hadn't launched a product in 20 years, et cetera, but it's pretty cool. So when you just mentioned those three or four points for hospitality of design, um, sustainability, quick ship, um, et cetera, et cetera, I'm really ha like, I'm very happy to hear that sustainability is coming back into the forefront in the discussion from, you know, 2006 or seven or eight, whenever lead first jumped onto the scene. But now I feel like it's wholeheartedly back and it's authentically back. I'm curious as far as 
you know, Heller being predominantly plastic, how do you, what's your sustainability story? Um, and just to let us know about that. I'd love to hear about it. So it's, it's multi-pronged. Number one is great design has longevity. So Heller product lasts forever. It's been, it's trading on first dibs, trading on eBay. It, it, and that alone with the authorship and the story becomes a classic and, they, and it lasts. Number two, we're 100% recyclable, which is huge. I mean, people are buying, oh, I'll buy this because it has X amount of recycled product. But if it's not recyclable again, it goes into a landfill. Mm -hmm. So we are 100% recyclable. Our new launches are going to be a minimum of 25% uh, post-consumer waste, which allows it to be, you know, it's an amazing concept and still mm -hmm. recyclable. Um, with our rocking chair, we've launched the first ever, ever NFT that comes with the furniture, no giving lifelong guarantee of authenticity and lifelong recyclability instructions. We'll take them back. We'll take any of our product back and recycle it into new product for you. It doesn't have to go through us, but it can. Yeah, I, a, a friend of mine, he, he, he works in carpet and he he's saying most of the carpet companies that are out there, they all all of them offer to take the carpet back and recycle it and make new stuff. But ultimately what happens, it's still because of the owners and the fast speed of the schedule, it winds up in landfill. But he came up with this really cool plastic additive. I'll send it to you after because I don't have the information right now where they add it to the plastic so that if it does wind up in landfill, when it hits a certain um, temperature and pressure, it biodegrades and then they can measure and then they can measure so many other things off of that. And I just thought that that was really interesting. Um, but I'll, we'll, I'll, we'll talk about that offline. Um, yeah, fair enough. When you're going around and, and presenting Heller to designers in hospitality and everywhere, going on the sustainability front, how, how much, how often is sustainability the first question that people ask these days? I mean, whether it's the first or fifth, I would say it's on equal ground. Mm -hmm. And I would say 98% of the time. Yeah. I bring it up as well. Uh, I don't think, I think it's a given today. I don't think it's if you have a sustainability story, it's, it's, it's what is it? Mm -hmm. um, and I think all the, all the consumers are demanding. It's a consumer driven decision. Um, and I see it everywhere, not just hospitality, contract, consumer, but everywhere. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, I love that it, again, it's, it's back in the forefront and people are talking about it. It's on the tip of everyone's tongues. Um, yeah, it's the right thing to do. Totally. And then as you're surveying the market out in front of you, you know, you're, you're in full on past launch mode. You're like entering orbit. Like as you look out there with respect to yourself, your team and Heller, what's exciting you most about the future? I mean, new product. Like I just get crazy for new product and I'll show you. Can you grab me into the little limbo? I'll show you a way that we're doing We're we're, we're miniaturizing our collection mm. um, because of our materiality and the way we make product it's pretty easy to miniaturize and i have the first sample of something we're launching on may 20th oh cool which is Let's in new it. york which is making me crazy it's a cleaner atlas and design oh wow so you can just set it all up on a table and people and pass it around and everyone can touch and feel it it's like a mini a mini chair or mini whatever you're printing con. Yeah, by Neocon, I'll have the entire collection in a briefcase for oh, presentations. That's awesome. I think that hasn't been done in the industry before. People do one piece or so, we're going to do the whole collection. I have my. Uh, How many my rocking... pieces are in the connect collection? Oh, that's a little rocking chair. Uh, I guess there's 18 pieces or so if you discount like the different sizes. Mm -hmm. um, but we're having the largest launch, in, obviously, in the company's history uh, in New York during Design Week. And that, that just, to me, is thrilling because we can't just say, okay, keep buying the stuff that was designed 20, 30 years ago. What's next? What, what's relevant about the company? And uh, that's what I love. That's what we're developing. Okay. So then let's talk about that as far as the product or industrial designers. How are you, how do you search them out and decide like who's best for your narrative and bringing, the, bringing your collections forward? In general, it's industrial designers uh, because for me, you know, I, I'm devoted to modern. And modern is aesthetically pleasing, designed for a purpose, no ego in the design, and it can go anywhere. So this is a hospitality uh, podcast, mm -hmm. but something that can go to hospitality, can go to residential, can go to corporate, 
can go almost anywhere. So it has to be someone that can design a piece of product that sits on its own without an environment to validate it. And that's really, really hard. So normally that's not an interior designer, it's a product designer. And then you look at who, like in the short term, who have I had success with? And, and, and Cleaner Atlason is probably one of the best designers I've ever worked with. Uh, nobody understands this, but he designed the 1942 bottle for Don Julio. Uh, as oh, well wow, as, that's huge. Yeah, 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 as well as the best launch in our history of design within reach. So these designers that we usually we work with can design almost anything. Um, and they have to really put their ego aside and try to design something timeless. Designing modern is really, really hard. Mm. Uh, so we fail more than we succeed. You know, so I, I kill a lot of projects or I have in the past before we get too far along because you're just not going to be there. Once they get overcomplicated, I think you, you have to bail. I also love that earlier you said like the most successful people on your teams are the ones who where they are the bartender, so to speak, right? Yeah. And for yeah, him yeah. or for them to have designed the Don Julio 1941 bottle, it like they are the ultimate bartender because that <laughs> is really just, that's like the Chanel number no. five kind of bottle design, right? It never goes I think it's away. the only bottle that's launched in the past 10 years that's become iconic. If you look at what Absolute did to their bottle, it wasn't a great bottle, but it was an amazing messaging on the bottle. This is actually a, a, a bottle design that it's a character in the movies about WeWork and uh, uh, and Uber and such. It's actually in the in the movies as a character. It, it symbolizes an era, mm. and that's not common. Um, so on, on the hospitality front, I know like especially well rooms, public areas, everything gets all really used it's oftentimes it wasn't it wouldn't be used in your home right there's a lot less care etc cetera, etc cetera. i forgot that you were the executive chairman of krypton fabrics which you know those textiles and the protection on them it really it's really important that they last how did you find your way into krypton and like what's exciting you most about that type of technology as well because to yes. me that seems really different than all of this modern authentic design that you've been doing with design within reach and also uh heller you know uh things come full circle and during years and years ago when i had edelman leather uh krypton approached us and we had the exclusive for the krypton technology in our leather so we were the only you know most cleanable leather in the industry powered by krypton i made friends with the founders I made friends with their team jump forward 15 years they sold the business to Berkeley Capital, and Berkeley called me in to work with management and just help them uh, maximize the potential of the brand. So that, that, that brought me back into Krypton. So it's it's like an old, like a nice old coat to put back on. It it, it feels nice and warm. And then with Berkeley, uh, we also bought uh, uh, Chilowich, which in hospitality is a is a is a a, a, a a classic product, which is now run by uh, John McPhee, my best friend, who's now the CEO of uh, Chilowich. I'm on the board of Chilowich. So everything spins around and comes back and and uh, it makes a full story. So mm. so it, it does not seem like I belong at Krypton and I totally belong there. And what like what excites home. you most about what excites you most about what what Krypton has done and is doing for hospitality in general? I think giving them an alternative with that, of a product that has a great hand, has a sustainable sustainability story, being PFAS free, and it's cleanable. I mean, it's listen. Hotels take a beating, a beating every day. And the longer they look good, the better it is for the developers, for the designers, for everybody. And Krypton's an option that wears like iron. Mm. And is, so if they want to drink red wine, the consumer is always right. Uh, the, the, the patron of a hotel is always right. If they want to drink red wine on a white sofa. That's their prerogative. Uh, but it better be cleanable. You better be able to, to, to keep that looking good. Because, you know, what do you have, uh, three hours before somebody else comes in and uses the same room? or yeah. lobby or bar seat or banquet if you're lucky it has to be something that that is meant yeah and, and and listen if you specify it for hospitality their parameters their their, their demands it has to meet and i think mm. people forget about a company like krypton that meets those demands yeah we're like, getting yeah. back into hospitality but i can say via the consumer because the consumers asking for it at design within reach at um our house at places like restoration highway and and they want that product around mm. so I think uh, a lot of residential trends end up tripping upwards towards hospitality. Yeah. Um, and vice versa. Totally. Well, that's cool to hear. It's very varied, but I do like how it's like this, uh, this self-fulfilling wheel of, of design and product and, uh, 
And it's also great that you get to work with your best friend in because that's what keeps me in this world too. I get to work with all my best friends. <laughs> well, it's been, we've only been best friends for 30 years. So we're working on the, the next 30. But anyway, years ago, uh, I guess 2008 or nine, my, my good friend since 10th grade uh, bought back his family business, which was Waterworks. And I, I was part of that team. We bought back Waterworks and, uh, and repaired the business and ended up selling it to Restoration Hardware. But that's a friend I, I met, you know, in summer school. Wow. <laughs> so, so the industry is, the industry is tiny and, and friends stay friends, hopefully. Um, as you're looking forward, you know, we're in these tumultuous times. Um, projects are still happening. Design is still happening. Um, what's keeping you up at night and why? So macroeconomic trends to me have no bearing on Heller. We're small enough that trends don't matter. We're, we're a great company that's been under-marketed, underserved the marketplace. So we have five years of growth, whatever the market is. I could care less. Um, what keeps me awake at night are more like, you know, a COVID epidemic again. Things that are like, that are just so mind-blowing. Uh, uh, if, if the war, you know, it, it gets too strong uh, with Russia, we get too involved in that and people can't travel. Mm. You know, the, just just terrible big things. <laughs> but but economic things not so much got it what about as as you grow and prepare for this growth as far as your team like what types of people are you looking for how are you looking to build out your team well i'm double the age of almost everybody in my team uh right now there's five of us and i don't have any worries about building our team it's gonna happen organically i just hired a young woman that has barely graduated from college uh because I've worked with her in the past. She worked trade shows with me, a, a friend of the family's, and she's a doer. And I can just, I know I'm going to be able to throw whatever I want at her, and it's going to get done. I hired in my, my, who, the guy who helps me in product development, went to um, SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, he was a swimmer. I love the fact that he was an athlete early on. And, uh, and he loves everything we're doing. Like, he just loves, you know, working on the Vignelli stuff. We went to the Vignelli Center at Rochester for a talk. I did a talk up there, and he, was in the archives, just like luxuriating in the history of Heller and other Vignellis. I don't know. I, I, I have zero fear of, uh, of how we're going to build the team. Wow. It's people who love design and, and get excited to go to work and, and who I want to be around all day long. Like we have a small office yeah. um, and I'm a loud guy. So they want to be around me and do I want to be around them? It's, it's, it's not the most difficult formula, but it's, it's, it's fun. Like we have fun. I think whoever's in the office, we all go to lunch together every day we're here it's, it's a it's a really tight knit small group i want to go back in time a little bit to design within reach as far as all the different collections and skews that you had from there what was the most surprising relaunch that you had as far as overall success like where where what was a product that you were like okay i knew this would be good but holy cow i had no idea it was going to be that good a surprise of how good it was, a relaunch. I mean, so Milo Boffman. Um, I was the world's largest private collector of Milo Boffman furniture. I had uh, initially the recliners that I bought at the flea markets, you know, 25, 30 years ago mm. for $10 a piece. I didn't know who designed them for 10 years um, until I found the second one. Then I found a piece of metal furniture and I started researching Milo and realized that the recliners are Milo Boffman. I found the original factory with their Coggin. We brought them back. The first time it was ever brought back and they went like hotcakes. So that was a surprise how much people loved Milo Boffman. The second half of that was I brought some other pieces back that I was in love with that the consumer just didn't like. Like they just didn't like it. Oh. Um, and you have to accept it when they don't like it and just move on. Um, there's a designer named Chris Hardy out of Atlanta. He's very involved in, in, in the hospitality industry. I love this guy. And I met him when he was just a kid. We did a very successful launch where I paired him with Jens Rism. When Jens was like 90 years old, they did a, a storage collection. And then I launched a table of his that's in my house now. It's my coffee table. It's my favorite table we ever launched. And it was a great table, but we launched it with a, 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 squ a rectangular glass top. It was meant to have an oval glass top. And it didn't look right, mm -hmm. and it failed. So that was just disappointing. We didn't have the budget to redo all the tops and ended up going by the wayside. But you know, for every great success, you fail multiple times. 
And that's why I love, and I'll just go to talk about Be Original Americas, is if you don't specify authentic products, you specify knockoffs, you slowly kill the future of design. Because mm. it's, it's expensive to design a product. And then you do all the work, you get it out there, you sample it, you show it, and sometimes you're just wrong. And you have to be able to fund the next project. So if you work all those years to make a great product and it gets copied, you, you can't make the next one. Totally. And uh, and I'm gonna be surprised. We're not. We're we're wrong. I, but if you're gonna be wrong, try to be wrong small, <laughs> and and be right big. That's the general formula. Totally. Or be wrong. Be wrong yeah. small. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You hit a lot of singles and then load up the bases and then you hit the home run. Um, exactly. Let's see. If I were to ask you to go back in time to how old were you when you started working at Le Edelman Leather? As a, you were little, uh, right? Well, oh, yeah, I worked every summer of my life uh, before I could drive in the warehouse, every Christmas vacation. Uh, but then I left Edelman uh, for the shoe business for eight years. But I've always been working. So like 13, 14 or, or earlier? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, 13, 12, 13, 14. Yeah. 12, 13, 14. If you, if I was six foot tall at 12 years old, so I looked older. Oh, wow. So you were, you were the star <laughs> basketball player, weren't yeah. you? No, the worst basketball player. <laughs> um, Remember, you know me. You know my son is great. It's because yes. I married well. It's not because of me. Oh, okay. She brought the, uh, she brought all the coordination I, and athleticism. I, I said if he had my skills, he'd be selling basketballs, not playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Leather basketballs at that. Yeah. Well, if, if we went back to your 14 or 15 year old self where you're, working in the leather warehouse and you're sorting hides and rolling. I don't know. What do you do in a leather warehouse? You check quality, you pull hides, you receive them, you roll them in and ship them to the, and ship them out. Okay. So but quality is number one, checking quality. The successful entrepreneur, John Edelman, that I'm speaking to now that's had, you know, I don't, I think it's more than 50%. I think it's less than 50% luck. I think it's mostly you just know what you're looking for and you're able to tap into that modern authentic vision if you will and but if you the john edelman i'm speaking to now showed up in front of your 14 or 15 year old self and gave had advice for yourself what would it be hmm. keep doing what you're doing um and but enjoy it so the biggest thing i regret if that's the question maybe it's about how to how to describe regrets it could be is is i traveled my whole life aggressively for the business uh, in, in leather, I traveled to Thailand and to Italy all the time. And in the shoe business, I was in Taiwan and Brazil. I would say to anybody today who's traveling aggressively, take an extra day on every trip and, and, and see where you're going. I mean, I've been to China 30 times. I've never been to the Great Wall. Um, you know, go to a, take a day for museums. I think maybe today's kids do it more, but I didn't know that then. You know, I missed my best friend's wedding. I showed up for the vow. And the second they said I do, I jumped back on the train to New York to go to a shoe show. And in retrospect, it was a mistake. You know, I think breathe a little more, take the extra day, I would tell myself. But but uh, on the business side, I'd say keep doing what you're doing. It's been fun so far. Yeah, I, that really resonates with me as far as, I think I've been to China 80 or 90 times and I never saw the Great Wall either. It was just in and out. I've showed up to friends' rehearsal dinners, but missed the weddings. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's important to take that extra day. I've been trying to do it more and more, but also I like to get back to my kids. They're yeah, the only little is, for but, so long, <laughs> right? But I, I'm talking about even before I had kids, you know, which is really there was no excuse. Mm. But the culture around me was so rush, 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 get here, get there, you know. And sometimes you're you're rushing to get nowhere. Um, and what's going to value be valuable for yourself? in years to come mm. is that knowledge that you gain then and it, it'll come out all the time it'll always serve you well like uh, my grandmother used to say oh johnny john g you know when you're in taiwan there's this great museum in taipei and i used to like laugh at her and now i'm like oh my god she was so smart <laughs> i can't believe i didn't go totally but, you know you learn i try to teach my kids um okay this has been awesome if people wanted to learn more about you or heller what can they do how can they find out more so I'm super easy, like Heller, uh, hellerfurniture.com. We actually respond to everybody. We're small enough. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm responsive on LinkedIn. Um, I'm the easiest person to get a hold of. So, so I would say hellerfurniture.com and John Edelman at LinkedIn. Awesome. Uh, well, I want to just say thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are. And like with all my guests, I'm just amazed that people want to come here and talk to me and our listeners. So thank you, John. This has been you, a you long time. You make it incredible. 
You make it incredibly easy. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I don't want to forget our listeners. Thank you, listeners. We keep growing every single week. Last time I checked, we were the number 27 design podcast in the United States, which is crazy. So people are listening and picking up the message. So if you learned anything or changed your perspective on hospitality or design, please pass it along. We've been growing by word of mouth. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time.